So we'll start with just a general introduction about C-star uh, Banach algebras. So let's just start with the Banach, Banach algebras, uh, Banach and C-star algebras. So we'll just start with some general introductory theory. Uh, so first, what are the objects we're talking about? So uh, a Banach algebra is a Banach space. Uh, let's call it A, uh, which is also an algebra. So all my uh, Banach spaces and Banach algebras, they'll be over complex numbers just for simplicity. Uh, so it's a Banach space over the complex numbers A, uh, which has a, a, a product structure making an algebra, uh, which has an algebraic product structure. And of course, we want the norm to be compatible with the algebra structure, so we require that um, the product of two elements, the norm of the product is at most the product of the norms. So it's less than or equal to. So that's a uh, Banach algebra. Uh, there's a very nice example to keep in mind, especially if you like group theory, uh, and that is if, uh, say, gamma is a group. So then we have the Banach space L1 of gamma. So A L1 of gamma. So this is a Banach space uh, with the L1 norm. And uh, we have a product structure on this, which is given by convolution. So the convolution of two uh, vectors in L1 is defined by the sum for T and gamma, C, S, T inverse, eta, T inverse. So that's the formula for convolution. Or uh, one way to think about this is you can just check what is convolution, say, uh, on the Dirac functions. If you have the Dirac function uh, S and you can evolve this with the Dirac function with T, then hopefully I've written down the formula correctly so that it should be the Dirac function at S and T. So convolution, uh, if you restrict to just Dirac functions, it's group multiplication. And hence, if you just look at the span of these things, you get a copy of the group algebra. Um, convolution just gives you the natural way to extend multiplication of the group to, uh, to finite combinations. And then this extends also to L1 combinations. So we have uh, um, Young's inequality. Which says that the summation is absolutely summable. And in fact, we get another L1 function and the L1 norm is less than or equal to the product of the L1 norms of the two, which is exactly the condition for it to be a Banach algebra. Right? So I'll leave it, this is part of the home, first homework assignment is to verify these things if you haven't seen them before. Um, so this is a very nice example of a Banach algebra, which you can associate to any group. Uh, this Banach algebra also has an involution. So you can define the involution uh, of some L1 function by just requiring this to be that function at the inverse, but then you want to take complex uh, conjugation here. Uh, because we want involutions usually to be anti-linear. Uh, or if you like to think of this as what is this on the natural basis elements of the group, we have that uh, delta s hat is equal to just delta the Dirac function at s inverse. So this is just naturally extending the inverse 
formula on the group to the L1 uh, space. And you can check that this, uh, in, this gives you an involution, so you do it twice, you get back itself. Uh, it also satisfies the natural compatibility with convolution, so these are all things that I'll leave you guys to check that uh, reverses uh, the order of convolution. And it's also asymmetric with respect to the L1 norm. So uh, we'll call such a thing a, an involution uh, on a Banach algebra. So uh, an involution is an anti-linear map um, which takes an element A and so I wrote a hat here because uh, convolution we already use a star but in general I'll, I'll use the star notation so it gives us an anti-linear map from A to A uh, which when you square it you get back uh, the original element, so such that a square star star is equal to a, and uh, and I want it to be uh, an isometry, although some, not everybody agrees that it should be an isometry, but for this class we'll agree it's an isometry. Alright, so that's an, oh, and it should of course reverse multiplication, uh, a b star is equal to b star a star. So this is an involution on uh, Banach algebra. So we see that the L1 algebra of a group has a natural involution uh, as well. Uh, oh yes, thank you. You shouldn't have two. They should, uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, so this is a basic example of a Banach algebra. Another basic example of Banach algebra is B of H. Uh, so here's another example. So H, Hilbert space. Uh, so B of H is the set of operators which are uh, bounded and linear. So this is naturally a Banach space with the Banach norm, the operator norm, which is defined as the soup overall uh, vectors less than or equal to one the uh, norm of t times c. So it's a standard exercise to check that this gives uh, a Banach space structure to b of h. Uh, and moreover here, it's also easy to check that composition satisfies uh, this property right here. So that uh, this is a Banach, this is a Banach algebra. under composition, being your multiplication. Uh, this is also has a natural involution, which the involution is taking adjoints. Uh, so add to uh, the adjoint operation gives involution. Um, and this says, so this is in particular an, a Banach algebra with involution, and it satisfies one extra identity, which is very, very useful for us. This is the C star, al C star algebra identity, and that is that the norm of T star T is always equal to the norm of T squared for any bounded operator. Uh, so this is the, uh, this identity right here, 
that's called the C star algebra identity. So this identity is the C star algebra. Okay. And a C star algebra is just a Banach algebra with an evolution which satisfies this identity. Uh, so algebra. B of H is naturally a C star algebra. Uh, should we verify this identity? Maybe let's verify so this should be an easy identity to verify. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this. Uh, so one hand, uh, on one hand we have the obvious thing that just being a Banach algebra you have to check, of course, that taking adjoints is uh, isometric, but I'll leave that to you guys. So in that case, we certainly have that this is the Banach algebra property it tells us this, so that's no problem. Uh, so we just have to prove the reverse inequality. So let's go ahead and try that. Uh, so the reverse inequality, the norm of this, uh, squared, so this should be equal, I could probably just plug in the definition, yes, uh, so this is the soup over all vectors of norm less than or equal to 1 of t c squared which we're in a Hilbert space, so we know the square norm is given by the inner product, and then we can use the adjoint. So this is the soup over C less than or equal to one of T star T, C, C. Uh, by now, of course, we're in a Hilbert space, so we have Cauchy-Schwartz. So we can then write this as less than or equal to the soup we're all vectors less than or equal to 1 of the norm of t star t, c. And by definition of the uniform norm, this is less than or equal to the norm of t star t. All right, piece of cake. Uh, so b of h is a special kind of Banach algebra, which is a c star algebra. Um, in particular, any closed subalgebra, which is also closed under taking adjoints, is another C star algebra. So any closed uh, Banach star subalgebra of B of H gives us another C star algebra. Uh, the other key example of a C star algebra is that if we have any topological space, uh, so say X is a Topological space, so then we can consider continuous bounded functions on X. So these are continuous functions from X to the complex numbers, which are uniformly bounded. Uh, and this uh, will be a C star algebra, so this is a, a C star algebra. with the algebra structure just given by pointwise operations. So at each point you add or multiply or uh, whatever. So with uh, pointwise operations, and the norm, making it a Banach space, is the uniform norm. Uh, and norm, the norm of a function is the supremum for all x and x of the absolute value of f of x. And then it's an easy exercise to check that this gives a C star algebra uh, to any topological space. Uh, of course, if you 
take general topological spaces, there may not be a lot of functions in this. Uh, so you usually want to assume that the space is at least, you know, um, Hausdorff or, or, or type T1 at least, so that the uh, functions actually separate points. Um, so you can actually see the space from the continuous functions. Um, okay, so uh, basically whenever Eurozone's lemma applies is when you get a nice C star algebra. All right, so this is another C star algebra to, to keep in mind. Um, so one thing about Banach and C star algebras, which is very nice, is they all have lots of invertible elements. So here we have a, a Banach algebra. So we're going to let G of A uh, be the set of oh, this Banach algebra is with with a unit, and the unit I'll always denote by one. Uh, so then we let G of A be the set of invertible elements. So these are elements which have both a left and a right uh, inverse. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, Banach algebras <laughs> typically have lots of invertible elements. In fact, we'll prove a little lemma here. And that if we have an element of our Banach algebra, which is not too far away from one, it can be, it doesn't have to be really close to one, but it just can't be far away from one, uh, then it's invertible. Uh, so then x is uh, so the proof of this is very easy. It's just exactly what you would do if we were working with the, our favorite Banach algebra, which is just the complex numbers themselves, right? So if you had x were just a complex number, then of course it would be invertible, uh, and you could find its inverse by a geometric series. So we just write that down. So let's set uh, y to be the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 minus x to the n. And then because of the main Banach space, Banach algebra identity there, of course that means that if you apply the norm to any power that's less than or equal to the norm to that power, so we get that if we take partial sums, so the norm as, uh, say, sum goes from k to infinity, 1 minus x, uh, this norm here, or maybe I should say k1 to k2. So now we can just use the triangle inequality and then the Banach norm. So this is less than or equal to the sum as n goes from k1 to k2, norm 1 minus x to the n. And because the norm of 1 minus x is less than 1, this is a convergence, a convergence series, so this can be made uh, as small as epsilon, so we get a Cauchy sequence. Uh, so therefore, this y is well defined because we're in a Banach space, uh, so therefore y uh, is in gives uh, converges absolutely and gives us a well-defined element in A, and I claim that this is the inverse, x inverse. Uh, and to check that, we just do a computation. Um, so let's uh, just do the computation here then. Probably we just want to multiply the whole thing by 1 minus x times y, and then we see that this is just equal to um, y minus 1 minus x, um, just because we start the sum one step up. And then if we distribute things and try to cancel, uh, what do we get? We get that uh, 1 minus x 
is equal to x times y. Uh, is that what I want to say? What did I want to say? x times y x times y, or y times x, I claim that x times y should be 1, yes? So, or x times something should be 1. Uh, Why? Oh yes, thank you. Y minus one. That looks better. Uh, so then we get that x times y is equal to one. Yes. Thank you. All right. So we get that. Therefore, x times y is equal to one. Uh, and similarly, if we multiply by one minus x on the right, then we get that y uh, times x. Uh, and y times x is equal to 1. All right. So that was a nice lemma. So what's important here is not just that we found that there are lots of invertible elements or, or the statement of the limit itself, is less important than the fact that we we also have a, a specific geometric series for the formula for the inverse. And so this also gives us, for instance, a bound on the norm of the inverse. Uh, so a consequence you can do of that is actually show that not only do we have lots of invertible elements, but the space of invertible elements forms an open set and inversion is continuous. So the next proposition so again, we have a Banach algebra with an identity, uh, and we have the G of A is open, and inversion is continuous. So let's go ahead and prove this. Uh, so let's uh, find, let's fix some in invertible element. And so we need to find some number such that when x is very, very close to y, then x is invertible and x inverse is very, very close to y inverse. So this is the goal. Uh, all right, so uh, basically we just kind of bootstrap this thing up here. Uh, so we want to write, uh, so if x minus y, um, we want this to be, well, this is equal to, um, uh, we factor out a y, so we get uh, x, y inverse minus 1 times y. And this we can say, uh, so if this, uh, what do I want to say? If this is very small, then I want to say that uh, the other way around. So I want to say if this is small enough, I want to factor out a different way. So if this is less than something we'll discover in just a moment, so then uh, x, y inverse minus 1 should be less than uh, so now we factor out the y inverse here, less than or equal to x minus y, y inverse, which is less than or equal to x minus y, y inverse, and we want to say this is less than 1 so that we can apply the previous lemma. So what do we need to put here? We need to put, I guess, uh, 1 over y inverse. 
All right, so if the distance from x to y is at most one over the norm of y inverse, then we get that x times y inverse is close enough to one. Hence, we can apply the previous lemma, so we get that therefore, x y inverse is an invertible, which of course implies x is invertible because we already know we just multiply by y, uh, hence x is invertible. Um, but we get more than just that x is invertible because we get a formula for the inverse, which is the geometric series. So we even get that the norm of x y inverse inverse is less than or equal to the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of um, of uh, all its powers, so one minus x y inverse to the n, or we can put the n out here, uh, which we already saw up here, so we get that some, we get a usual geometric series, and, uh, and we can just say that this is then equal to, I guess, one over one maybe factor out a y inverse first, and then we get one minus the norm y inverse times y minus x. Right. Uh, so what does this then tell us? It tells us some, something about the distance between x inverse to y inverse. y inverse. So now I'll just need to factor things out in a clever way. So to use that previous thing, uh, so that's just y x inverse. So I'll factor out y inverse. So this is something like y inverse. And now we have x y inverse inverse minus See that I want to keep just like that. Uh, X inverse y inverse. Now I'll factor out. I'm gonna do it not quite directly. So let's factor out an x inverse on the left. Consult my notes, make sure I'm on the right page. Yeah, so this x inverse. I'll factor out an x inverse on the left and a y inverse on the right. So here we'll get y minus x. Y inverse. All right, I like that because we have the y minus x, which looks good. And now here, yeah, so now I'll use the Banach algebra norm. So here we have x inverse, the norm of x inverse, but I'll use, I wanna use this formula, which is, I guess, y times x inverse. So I'll write this as y inverse, and then x y inverse inverse. And then we have a y inverse, and then we have a y minus x. So that's just the Banach algebra norm. Uh, and then I can factor out another, I can pull out another y inverse here and use this estimate here. So this is less than or equal to, here we have y inverse, now we have two of them squared. But y is fixed, so it doesn't matter how many y inverses we have. And then we have one minus y inverse, and then we have y minus x, and then we have a y minus x here. All right, so this gives us what we, what we need, because of course, 
uh, here we have y minus x, y minus x, and everything else doesn't involve x. Right? So as y minus x goes to zero, we see that this function goes to zero. All right, so this goes to zero as y minus x goes to zero. So therefore, we get that the x and the inverse of x approaches the inverse of y. All right, so that shows that in invertible elements is open, and we even get that uh, inversion is continuous. Uh, another thing I'll mention right here, well first let me give you a definition. So uh, if we have x is an A, A is again a Banach algebra uh, with a unit. So if x is an A, so then the spectrum of x is denoted by sigma x, and this is the set of complex numbers such that x minus y is not invertible. So whenever x minus, and whenever I write a complex number, I mean complex number times the identity in the algebra. So uh, that's the spectrum of them. Uh, we'll say the complement of the spectrum is the resolvent. So the resolvent x is rho x, which is the complement of the spectrum. Uh, so one useful proposition we can prove right now, um, which comes from the analysis we've done so far, but actually not directly, is the following proposition. So, proposition, and that is that the spectrum of x times y, well, is the same as the spectrum of x as y times x, except the possibility is, is of course you could have one invertible while the other is not invertible. So if you throw in zero, then that's the only thing that can, the only possibility that can. Uh, so this is a very useful uh, proposition to keep in mind, uh, and we can prove this now. So this is actually true um, not even in a Banach or even normed algebra, just any algebra with an identity, and uh, you can define the spectrum in the same way uh, over the complex numbers, and then you still have this proposition. You'll see we, we, don't, we only use just straight algebra. Um, but where the proof comes from uses analysis. So let's first prove this. Uh, let's take the case first. Consider when, um, say, x times uh, y and y times x are both uh, less than or equal to 1. So x times y and y times x both a single. So let's suppose that say both x and y are very very small uh, in norm. Uh, so then what can we do? Well so we want to show that if something's in this, uh, if xy minus something is invertible in one then that yx minus the same thing is, is also invertible. Of course by scaling everything um, it's enough just to take, uh, we can add the complex number to x times y. Uh, so let's just look at uh, when we subtract 1 first. So let's suppose uh, if xy uh, minus 1 is invertible, so then we want to show that yx minus 1 is invertible, uh, but then that's no problem because uh, xy and norm is less than 1, so we have a nice formula for this. So we have we know this is in fact already the case, and we can write down the formula for the inverse. It's exactly just the sum 1 minus xy to the nth. Uh, oh, sorry. The inverse, this is the one that's invertible. So 1 minus xy. Xy. 
You know? uh, and then here we can factor out, a, uh, just like we've already been doing, we can factor out an x on the left and a y on the right. And so we can write this as x times, oh, I guess we have the identity first, so we can write this as 1 plus x sum over n x, y to the n y. Um, sum over y x. Sum, oh yes, thank you. Sum over y x, that's the whole point. Is that we pull out just one x on the left, one x on the right. Uh, but now we see that this formula, since y x is also less than, I guess I should put less than one here. So we see that this converges and we get that this is equal then to one plus x, uh, one minus y x inverse y. But then kind of the magic which happens is we see that the beginning and end of this formula uh, don't involve sums at all. And in fact they're valid now even without this assumption. So the only thing we used this assumption was for the middle terms, but the formula is actually valid uh, in a general algebra. Um, so we can just verify this. In fact, we could have done this initially. I didn't need to introduce sums, but I just wanted to show you where the proof comes from. This is kind of a nice thing. So in fact, this formula in general holds. In fact, in general, we have uh, we just take this formula and let's multiply by 1 minus xy times 1 plus x, 1 minus yx inverse y. So let's just multiply this out and then we get 1 minus xy uh, plus, so that's there, and then I'll do 1 times this, so that's x, 1 minus yx inverse y, and then we'll do minus x, y, x, 1 minus y, x, inverse y. And now we can do some clever factorization, fact factorize in uh, a different way. Uh, let's see, what do we want to do? So we have 1 minus yx uh, inverse yx times xy. So we can combine this term and this term, and then we'll combine these things. So it's 1 plus, so first these two, x1 minus yx inverse y. And now we have this and this, so it's minus, uh, and then We'll factor out the x, and then what's left in the middle, we have one, oh, well that's one plus, that's not what we want. Factoring out the wrong. Uh, Yeah, I want to factor the right two terms. And that's right. Oh, yes. You're exactly right. So now we factor out just the x, and then what's left over, we yeah, have. Exactly. Thank you. 1 minus xy plus x. And now we have here 1 minus this, minus this. And so we get the identity. So we get xy. And now we get cancellation there, so that's one. All right. 
Uh, so this, you see, we didn't use any summation or anything. This is true in just a general algebra. And similarly, if you put the 1 minus xy on the right, you can do the same thing. So what have we shown? We've shown that if 1 is in the spectrum of yx, then 1 is also in the spectrum of xy. And like I said, then you can just multiply by any non-zero complex number, uh, and you get that, that the same thing holds there. So that proves, proves the lemma. The only case this doesn't cover is 0, and in 0 it's not true in general. Um, so, so this is a useful thing to not keep in mind. Um, Finally, let me finish with we should actually prove a theorem. Maybe that's named after somebody. So we have the following. So here's it's called a proposition. So again, a a Banach algebra algebra with unit, with the unit, and x, just any element in A. So the proposition is that then the spectrum of x is a non-empty compact set. All right, so let's prove this. So it's a subset of the complex numbers, and it'll always be a non-empty and compact set. Um, so why is this the case? Well, to see that it's uh, uh, compact, well, we're in the complex numbers, we just need to show it's closed and bounded. Uh, to see that it's bounded is easy enough, since if we have any, say, absolute value of lambda greater than the norm of x, well, then again, uh, that just means by dividing, we get that therefore x over lambda and norm is less than 1, and hence 1 minus that is invertible. So we get that therefore lambda is in the um, resolvent of x. Right? So therefore the spectrum of x is certainly contained in the ball of radius norm x. Right, so it's a bounded set. Uh, moreover, what do we know is that if we take uh, the set of invertible elements is open and inversion is continuous, so therefore we know that uh, the resolvent set will also be open. Also, since, since inversion, since G of A is open and inversion is continuous, so then we have that the resolvent of A is open. Because of course, if your x minus lambda is invertible and you have another uh, t which is close to lambda, then x minus t will also be invertible. Uh, so we don't even use inversions continuous, just that it's open. Uh, so in particular, the spectrum is closed, so it's closed and bounded, so it's compact. The only thing we have left to show is that it's non-empty. Uh, this is where we might have to take a little bit of a, uh, use a little bit of a trick. This is a standard trick, so the thing to note is let's fix a continuous linear functional, say phi. Uh, so this is, we're going to do this by contradiction. So suppose that the spectrum of x is empty. Let's fix a continuous linear functional. And then I'm, we're going to consider, consider the function which takes a complex number and sends it to phi uh, times uh, z minus x inverse. Since the spectrum is empty, uh, this is defined over the, all the complex numbers. Moreover, by what we've 
already done in the previous lemmas, uh, it's easy to see that this function, this complex function, is an analytic function. Right? So we can verify that pretty easily. So note, uh, if we look at the z minus x inverse minus v z naught minus x inverse, well, the linear functional we can pull out and then we can simplify. So this is v and then uh, what do we want to do here? We can write this as z minus x inverse, so factor this out, factor the other one out, and we we'll get the x's cancel, and so we get a z naught minus z, and then z naught minus x inverse. So therefore, if we divide this function by z minus z naught, uh, then uh, what do we see? We see that the limit as z approaches z naught uh, actually exists. All right, so therefore, therefore this is analytic. Moreover, what do we know? We know that the absolute value also, absolute value phi of z minus x inverse is certainly less than or equal to the norm of z minus x inverse. And we've also seen from what we've already done that as an element gets larger and larger, the norm of its inverse gets smaller and smaller. Uh, so that this goes to zero uh, as, so I guess we need the norm of phi there, uh, as uh, z goes to infinity. So this analytic function we see is uh, bounded, in fact, tends to zero as you go to infinity. But of course, then we have Louisville's theorem, which says that if you have a bounded analytic function, then it has to be constant, and it has to be constant zero because of this. Uh, so we get that therefore, uh, phi of z minus x is equal to zero. But of course, this immediately gives us a contradiction because, say, Han Banach allows us to attain the norm by choosing some linear functional. This was true for everything. So this contradicts harmonic. All right, so that proves that the spectrum therefore has to be non-empty. Uh, as a corollary of this, we get a theorem. I said we would prove a theorem named for somebody. So this is the gelfand mazur theorem. which is that uh, if A is a Banach algebra with unit, uh, which is also a skew field, meaning every non-zero element is invertible, uh, so such that every non-zero element is invertible. So then, uh, there's only one possibility, and that's its, its actual field, it's the complex numbers. So then A is equal to the complex numbers. So there are no skew fields uh, which are Banach algebras other than this particular one. So the proof of this, now we've done all the work, so let's suppose that we have this Banach algebra such that every non-zero element is invertible. Let's take any x and a. We know its spectrum is non-empty, so let's take lambda in the spectrum of x. So then x minus lambda is not invertible by definition of the spectrum, so therefore it has to be zero by hypothesis implies x is equal to lambda. Right, so we showed that it's the complex numbers. So it's just an easy corollary of this uh, fact that we proved that the spectrum is always non-empty. All right, let me stop here and then we'll continue on Wednesday. <laughs>